How are we doing? Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm George Moss again here at allpointstv.com. We are the program called What's Going On. And I want to also welcome again WFOV, this line 2.1, for you who are watching it, uh, listening to it rather, on radio. I'm back from a one week hiatus away from the studio. We did a program that we put in the can, so to speak, before I left, and this was what was aired last week. We're back live now, and we'll be doing our normal broadcast at 2 o'clock in the afternoon from 2 to 3 on Monday. And I think the day is the 28th, isn't it? Yes, and, it is. And so we are coming uh, to you live at this point. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the trip that I took, and I want to uh, give a shout-out to the person that hosted me in Arizona. I went to Arizona. Well, first of all, I flew into Las Vegas, and then I rented a car, and then I drove to Arizona, Kingman, Arizona, and I visited a Facebook friend uh, who, I, who I had not met uh, prior to my visit, but I had been talking, we have been conversing back and forth on uh, Facebook, some of the posts that I've been writing. He was one of the few persons that wasn't cursing me out. So... <laughs> So I want to find out who this guy was because he was a, one of the few persons that was not uh, jumping all over me when I would uh, do my writing. <clears throat> not that I'm, uh, not that I was um, uh, being interfered with. I'm going to write what I write. But I noticed this person, Don Heck, was uh, always seemingly in agreement with what I was writing, and I could not believe that there was anyone out there that would be in tune with what I write because I'm shooting from the hip all the time. And so when he found out that I was coming to Las Vegas, uh, he asked me to, he said, it's only 100 miles from Vegas to Kingman, Arizona, so why don't you take a car, your car and, that you rent and then drive down to Kingman? And so he, I didn't know any better, so I didn't know all those winding curves. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever driven uh, 93, Highway 93, but if you have... Uh, and then you go on, uh, across that desert. You're not going across that desert now if you if you half asleep, because everything is a winding curve and they're going around in all these little circular uh, d directions. Uh, you not you got to be alert. And, but I did it. and I'm very glad I did. I, I had a very good time. I was um, and also I'm a very historic uh, time as well because I went to a lot of the sites in Arizona and visited some of the old gold mines that were there and. Uh, one of the towns had wild barrels in it, and they're walking around in this little area there. I saw, I saw um, the um, the marital suite that was used by Clark Gable when he married um, uh, Gina. What was her name? Elijah Bridget. I can't. I think that's the name. Uh, Clark Gable got married in, uh, to, uh, I think, in '39. I can't remember who the person was. Was it Carol Lombard? Yeah, that was who it Karen was. Carol Lombard. I was going to say, because I remember, yeah, I think I remember, I think where you go on the story, yeah, I think that was Karen Lombard. It was yeah, it was Carol Lombard. Yeah. That, you're right. They mentioned the name. I wasn't a, I wasn't familiar with the name, but I, I, I went, in that particular uh, place that we went to, it had the uh, suite. You can call it that. It was, it, to me, it was, I, I, I said to the uh, person that I was with, I couldn't, I can't believe that that, that would have been considered a suite. Uh, but maybe at that time, it was a uh, marquee, but at, at, at the way it looked today, it was um, certain, certainly not something you, you would think Clark Gable would have taken his bride, but that's 39 and this is 2019, so, you know, figure, figure that one out. But it was uh, quite a quite an experience. I mean, to go into those Manning towns and see the, um, uh, the when they had the gold rush and so on out west, and having that experience, you know, seeing the burrows walking around, wild burrows walking around, um, very comfortable being around people, and uh, you know, you could buy some little foodstuffs grass packed into a, a cube and you could feed them and so on as long as you didn't uh, create a competition between them where they are jockeying for positions because they, would, because they will kick 
uh, each other. They get uh, if they get too close to competition for the food and so on. So you had to be very careful how you fed them. <clears throat> but it was it was quite quite an event. And I'm very glad I went out there uh, also. So for the uh, to because of the politics that I ran into, I went to the Republican, you know, headquarters in uh, in Kingman, and they had volunteers there. Two of them had recently migrated from California uh, by the two Hispanic migrants. And they were telling me that when they when they when they left, their relatives were asking them, "Why why are you why are you leaving uh, California?" They could not believe they leave California because of the liberal mindset that the family members were in, and they were kind of laughing about it, saying that uh, they could not believe that they left, but they're glad they left because they left all of that communism that's in California, <laughs> and so uh, they're glad to be out of there. And I, I'll tell you this too. Uh, in in Arizona, I was at by the way I was at home in Arizona, but in 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 Arizona, you feds, you guys talking about um, uh, uh, gun control and buying back guns. You ain't buying their guns back because in Arizona, uh, they are gun toting, Second Amendment quoting uh, citizens in that in that state. And nobody is going to get their guns uh, in terms of a buyback. And what is a buyback when they didn't buy it from the government in the first place? That ain't going to happen. Arizona, I hate to break it to you, but Arizona is locked and loaded. <clears throat> and anybody think you're going in there and you're just going to go in there as a, in, in a fell swoop and collect some guns against their will, uh, it ain't going to happen down there because that's a gun-toting Second Amendment uh, quoting uh, population throughout the state, and I was very glad to be there because I was a, I, because I was a, uh, I was home among my family members. <laughs> I don't mean blood ties. I'm talking about ideologically we were glued together. I went to the headquarters in in, in Kingman, and they had volunteers uh, there. They told me the volunteers in Kingman. Uh, they have it on a rotational basis. Some volunteer for Monday at these hours, and then when that time period is over, some others come in, they volunteer the time, and they're open <clears throat> for business every day. I so I went there on a on a Tuesday, I think it was, and uh, they had volunteers uh, that day, some very knowledgeable people. I was, I was, I was like, like, um, a kid in a candy store. I couldn't believe there were people there that understood the Constitution that was standing on it, had read it, understood a lot of the provisions. I was um, very happy to see the amount of constitutional ammunition they had. I, I, I have to say that I was uh, bringing up a few things that uh, might not have been in their peer view. But they were more knowledgeable than most people I run into. And I was a, uh, like, as I, like I said, I was like a kid in a candy store because I could not believe that there were these people that were grounded like they were in terms of what the Constitution requires. I mean, I don't, I, I, you, I don't find that anywhere in the city of Flint, these lightweights around here. But there it was family territory so in a way I was I, I'm back now from from that uh, trip I don't need to go back to to uh, Arizona because I, I had uh, the whole experience while I was there and I, I was in I was in Las Vegas uh, four days of my seven day visit to the Southwest and and I was in uh, Vegas because I have a timeshare that if I hadn't used it then I would have lost the time that I had in, in, in uh, Las Vegas. So I had to go down there and make use of my, of my uh, timeshare at, uh, at, at that point because after de December 31st, I would have lost it. And I won't have the time to go down there between um, now and then. So I'm very glad to have done that last week. What you saw last week here at the studio was a, a program we put in the can and we were able to air it during the regular time. And John was able to take care of that in my absence. 
John, you're doing so many things around here. I don't know why I'm in front of the camera. We should bring you up here and let you, let you sit in this chair. <laughs> I don't like being a, you know, when we first started doing shows, me and my friend Larry, you know, that's, and he's gone now. He died last, uh, two, summer and a half ago, summer ago. Yeah. Like a year ago, over a year ago now. Um, he, um, yeah, I, I just got really apprehensive. He got really apprehensive. Somebody noticed him in public, actually no, recognized him. <laughs> he, they freaked, he freaked out. Yeah, really. So right? have, have you ever anybody uh, come up to you? They don't freak me out. Yeah, well, they come, but, but they have recognized you? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. They recognize you, and they want to get in your face. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm as much in their face as they are in mine, and, I don't, and I, I'm on it. See, John, I'm, I'm unintimidatable. I, I, well, yeah. well, the thing is, you had to be because uh, you're you're a, you're a teacher. For thirty nine years, I'm well, I'm in the line of fire. It's people don't, and I'm used to it. Well, people understand teachers. You got to be a gutsy person because kids can be very intimidating. Yeah, and, and also very, administrators and very cruel. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, the thing is, a lot of them. I didn't get along with teachers. If I had you as a teacher, I probably got along great with you. But there's a couple of teachers I did because I didn't like the fact that they were they said something and they didn't want to be challenged. And when I knew something was wrong, they were saying it. I challenged them, and they got put off by that really bad. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had issues with teachers. And I had issues with principals. Not that I was going around just like smoking dope or beating up people. But when a teacher went off on something, I challenged them. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and when an administrator wanted me to like lick their boots, I was not good at that either. <laughs> so I mean, but uh, te teachers, good teachers are hard. That's to what find. they require, and they're licking, licking their, their boots. Oh yeah, I mean, I just I'm supposed to say yes. And that's or particularly no, true in the college level. Oh yeah, oh college, you don't bother. You uh, at college, yeah. you're paying for it. So basically, out of a real big moment. So basically, you play along and go along. You regurgitate the same stuff. You then you actually write down your own thought, thoughts on another separate piece of paper and keep it going. But, you know, otherwise you just give them back what they want because otherwise they will penalize you in college. They will still penalize you. Yeah, early. John, I told you about that time that I was kicked out of the uh, uh, college class. I think this must have been in my so sophomore year. Uh, we never forget the teacher. He's not not around now, given how many years have passed between now and, 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 and then. But I was put out of a class in my sophomore year uh, because the teacher was, was the, the instructor, I mentioned his name, Dr. Collins, was up there in front of the classroom uh, bragging about how hard his test was. And I had studied, you know, I was the kind of person that if I read something, uh, and I read a lot of it right before class, so it would be fresh in my mind. If I read something, I could pretty much uh, memorize it and what pages it was on. So I was actually going in there with the, with the pages in my, in my head. And <laughs> he was up there bragging about how hard the test was. And I remember his comment. He said, uh, he was a very, very arrogant uh, teacher. He was Phi Beta Kappa from uh, University of Alabama. And uh, he just wanted everybody to know how smart he was. He was saying, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that uh, you can't pass this test and I can't even pass this test myself without my notes. So I'm sitting there in my chair and I'm saying to myself, mm -hmm, right. And I was saying, I don't care what he asked because I even had read the footnotes and I had gone into the bibliography of, of the uh, chapters. So I didn't care what he asked. So he's talking about how hard the test was and you couldn't pass and all that. I'm saying to myself, you put that paper, you put that test on my desk and I'm out of here. But I wasn't trying to be smart. I, I had studied for his class, which met at, um, let's see, that class met at 10. And there was a class that would meet after lunch hour. So what I had to, what I was going to do was leave out of his class, take his test, whatever time it took. wasn't going to take that take that long. I was convinced of that. So I was going to ride out of his class, miss my lunch hour, study from uh, uh, whatever time I left out of his class, maybe about 10, 10, 10, 15, 10, 30. And then I was going to go study for the next test, which would be at 1 o'clock. I was going to miss my lunch hour and use that time period from his Dr. Collins class to the next class and study during that time period, have that fresh in my mind, and go in and take the next the next test, the midterm. <clears throat> so that was my plan. Uh, so Dr. Collins up there bragging, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can't pass this test, and I can't pass this test myself without my notes. And it was a hee-hee moment for him. And I'm sitting at my desk waiting for him to put that on my desk. And so, with my plan in place, I ran right through the test. I made some errors on it, but I ran through the test. And uh, within about, uh, what, 20 minutes, I was walking out the class, I, but my intent was to go study. So I walked out the class. I put the test on his desk and walked out. And so all the students that were sitting there, and they were struggling through it, and there I'm walking out the door, 
So they asked a the teach, they asked the instructor, and I know this because they came to tell me about it during the lunch hour. Uh, they said, um, "Dr. Collins graded his test," and Dr. Collins graded my test. And uh, when he did, he said, "Who is that young man?" And um, th- and they told me later on and said, "George, he didn't like it." They said that uh, you walked out of his classroom after he was talking about how, how hard the test was, you, <laughs> and you walked out of the classroom, and he didn't like that. And I found out that next classroom, he didn't like it. I made 95%, by the way, on that test. I made a couple of errors. If I had stayed long, I could have corrected, but I was determined to get out of there to go and, and get ready and get prepared. So that was on a Thursday. I'll never forget it. It was on a Thursday. And we met, the class met Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So I met, I went to class, the next uh, class period that Saturday. <laughs> and I had put my books down. It was raining that day. I had my umbrella in, uh, under my desk. And Dr. Collins walked across the threshold and pointed to me. And he said to me, without any introduction, any wording, he said, you can get out of here. And I had been, I had heard from the students that he didn't like me walking out like I did. And so he threw me out of that classroom because I had walked out of the classroom early, made 95% of this test, which he thought I was showing him up because he was saying he couldn't pass the test about his notes. And I walked out of the classroom. And he, caught, he went across that, thre- that threshold of that classroom, didn't even get inside the class uh, hardly, and pointed at me and told me to get out of his classroom. Now, today you would have a problem with that, but at that time period, you know, students didn't have uh, the room for, the wiggle room they have now, and no instructor would dare do that because of the fact that things have changed a little bit more swinging in the direction of the, of the, of the, of the students. Well, the students are not running, as a matter of fact, as long as they are within the liberal mindset of the instructor. That's one thing you're not going to challenge, the liberal mindset. So I um, understood the situation. I got my books and, and um, my umbrella. And without any objection, in his smart alec words, I got my stuff and I went and left the room. But here's the other side of it. I came back. And when I came back, I came back with an understanding of how to navigate through his nonsense. Because he didn't know why I walked out. I did. I walked out because I was trying to prepare for another test. He thought I walked out because I was a smart aleck. So I had to work on, on him in ways that he didn't know I was working on him. And, what was, and, and the way I was working on him was that When he gave the next test, which was the same cakewalk, because he couldn't teach me anything. Well, I don't want to say that, but he couldn't teach me anything that he's going to test me on. (laughs) That was not going to happen. So what I did to work on him, I worked on him by the next test, that he gave, I didn't walk out of the room. I was finished in the same time period, but I didn't, I didn't walk out. And after I finished, I don't have to walk out of his classroom. I can sit at my desk. That's not hard. I can sit there. I sit at, I sit at my desk, and I, what I did, I pushed my test to the side, and I started doodling. And the instructor came who was watching me all the time anyway because he thought that, I mean, that couldn't have happened last time. So he watching me, maybe I had some cheat notes or something. I don't know what his thinking was. I didn't care about his thinking. What I was doing was trying to fix the problem that I I had caused because I was not going to let him stop me because I understood something. He doesn't understand that a person may well stop, but the person cannot be stopped, and he was not going to stop me. So... He came around my desk, and I had my test pushed over to the side, and I'm sitting there doodling. 
and he saw me doodling in my test over here. And later on, when I passed it in, when everybody, when everybody else was passing their test in, and I had a similar score, a little bit higher this time, because I took more, I, I went back over it just to make sure I didn't make some stupid errors on it. And um, when I came back with my score, and having sat there with my test pushed to the side, I taught him something. And I, what I've taught him is that I'm not a smart aleck, I'm a smart student. And the smart student part was on my test score. The smart aleck part, meaning that I was not a smart aleck, but a smart student, I taught him that by sitting in my chair with my test being finished. <clears throat> now, I could have let him stop me by, you know, making all the objections about you, you picking on me, and I could have made all those objections. But I had learned that in high school in 12th grade when I was in Mrs. Reed's class. When she accused me, well, not, I mean, I can understand it. I had written two papers uh, that one time in her class. I had written one for a person named Adolph Davis, and I'll never forget that. That was in 12th grade. And I had written my own paper, and he passed his in without reading it. And it read the same way my paper did. It wasn't the same topic. It was two different topics. But the writing was similar, and the teacher caught that. And so since the writing was similar, she thought that <clears throat> since it was similar in both our cases, we had been copying from the same author on different topics. So she called us to the front of the room and she asked Adolph Davison to tell her what was in his paper. And he couldn't tell what was in the paper because he was, he didn't even read the paper, even if they had written it for him. And so he, he and hard couldn't say nothing about the paper. She told him, she told him, she, I remember her waving uh, at him, telling him, you know, look, you know, stop wasting my time. Go sit down. You didn't write it. Then she turned to me and she said, Moss, what's in your paper? And I told her what was in my paper. I didn't even get 30 seconds in the paper before she told me, okay. She said, you wrote it. Go sit down. And I went back and sat down. Now, I had learned a very important lesson in Mrs. Reed's room that I applied in Dr. Collins's room. And the lesson was that when she told me to go sit down, I followed her instructions when to sit down. But, but when I went back to my desk, I wasn't walking like I walked when I walked to the front of the classroom to her desk. I walked, I was floating back to my classroom because I walked back with this understanding that if she thought that there was cheating that went on in terms of the writing of Adolph Davidson's paper and then not there was cheating in the writing of my paper, I went back to my seat, floating back to my seat, because I knew then that she thought that was copied out of a book. I knew then I was pretty good. And that's why on Facebook, those of you that's watching on Facebook, Go read the article I wrote today on Facebook. I write on Facebook every day. And I got to write on Facebook right now because I got to try to spread some clarity of what they're doing because it's now in the danger zone. And I intend to point it out so these crooked and criminal politicians cannot get away with what they're trying to do. And there are criminals on both sides. And it's gotten now into a critical phase of it because now they've begun to go into virtue signaling to each other where the Republicans are talking to the Democrats and Democrats are talking to the Republicans. I got to point it out because I understand their, their coded uh, language. But I had learned that now back in the time period when I was in high school. And I use that in the, on, in the college setting with uh, Dr. Collins's class, for example. And I'm using it on Facebook right now. And there's nobody in the country. And when I say nobody in the country, I don't mean some exceptions to it. I mean everybody. And that includes these, these so-called constitutional scholars, <clears throat> none of whom are, are qualified to tie my shoes. I'm not bragging about that. I'm telling you the facts. <laughs> if they think, and I'm talking specifically to some people, including Alan Dershowitz, including Lawrence Tribe at Harvard University, 
And Judge Napolitano, he's included in that also. And all of the members of Congress and the rest of them. <laughs> I wish they would, but what they're talking about, uh, get on these posts. I'm going to be writing uh, on Facebook. I wrote an article today, and I'll be writing every day up until December the 3rd, uh, 2020, because we got to have a conversation publicly about what is going on and is now getting into the critical uh, stage because they know they cannot take this president down. And I support this president because he's the last thing standing between um, the American people and the overthrow of the republic of this country. That's what's happening right now. Okay, and John is doing his job. I got to do mine. John just told me we have a break coming up right now on WFOV 92.1. And I've got to allow them to take that break. They'll take it whether I allow it or not. And they'll be back in four minutes, and we'll be welcoming them back after that break is over, after that four-minute hiatus. Okay, uh, we want to stay focused on what we're talking about here on the on the on the on the allpointstv.com the program what's going on and we'll continue what we're talking about here I, I just want you to be aware now that this is now into a critical stage because this there's a lot of virtual signaling going on that may not be picked up by the layman the average layman that watches this program and also those that are on Facebook and on other social media that are getting information away from the FCC licensed uh, media, all of, all of which is uh, controlled by the licensing board that give them the uh, okay and approval to stay public. But the, um, the other media, the more independent media, not, not that Facebook itself is, is uh, anything, but those on the uh, network that are writing from a more independent uh, standing, uh, th that's who I'm talking, talking uh, about and talking to. I could care less about Facebook censors who are trying, who uh, this morning tried to censor the article I, I put on Facebook this morning. Uh, they took it down and then read it and then they placed it up when they found that um, uh, when, I, when I went on another uh, network and challenged them and told them what happened to my article. And because <laughs> I'm because I'm going I'm going to go around them, and I'm not going to give them any reason to come and do what they did to me two years ago, which is take me off the net, saying that my uh, my site had been hacked. I'm not going to allow that this time because I'm going to uh, make sure that I do not go outside of certain boundaries that I understand are there, and then give them the room to do what they did October two years ago, two years ago, because this we're now in, in critical mass now. And I wanna just, if I can just simply stay afloat on Facebook for two years and then use that site and then use the sites we have here at the uh, studio and, and elsewhere, uh, then we can, continue to have a public conversation, which is mandatory right now, given what is happening. Because as I said, we're in critical mass right now. And the two political parties are now doing virtual signaling. And I understand their dialogue that they have going toward each other and what they are saying right now. As a matter of fact, if you get a chance to read the post that I'll be placing on Facebook tomorrow, make sure you read it under, uh, under George Moss, which is I'm, public, I'm writing publicly because I have no fear, none. And I will not be frightened off of what needs to be done to get this work done, because I know what they're doing. And you don't know who these people are that you're dealing with from behind their mask. And John, this may be frightening for me to be saying this, <laughs> but I'm telling you what's going on here. Uh, I, I have no fear. And uh, we have got to have a public conversation because we are getting into some very 
uh, frightening um, situations right now because they never they never imagined that a person that that came from nowhere, okay, we're being signaled that we're back that WFOV is back, and so I want to welcome you back from the four minute hydrants that you took. And we're not far away from where we were when you left, so you're back now, and we are very glad to have you back. But we are around the same area we were when you when you took your four minute pause from us, and so glad you you're, you're back at this point. But uh, we have to understand something that's going on here, that neither political party differs uh, primarily from the, from each other. These they basically the flip sides of the same power power source, and uh, one, because of the fact that we have a Republican, I don't want to say he's a Republican Party member, he, is, he, he ran in the Republican Party. But he ran, but you have to understand something here. He ran in the Republican Party as an outsider, and they didn't want him in there, and they tried to get him out of there, but, but people said different. And that's why he became the nominee, not because of anything they did, but because the American people were looking for an outsider. And Donald Trump came on his train into the, the power center and came right on time, given the times in which he, in fact, launched his campaign. It would not have worked probably in 2012 when Romney, Romney was the, was the uh, standard bearer, not that he was standing up and doing anything, but he was a standard bearer for the, for the Republican Party at that time an election that he should have won, but he wasn't uh, anything, and it showed in the kind of campaign that he ran, and now he is, in fact, over here trying to sabotage Donald Trump's um, uh, administration. Didn't Romney's son actually come out after Romney's run and said his dad was not really all that sincere about running, he wasn't that intense about it, that committed? And that's the right, I mean, now why is he suddenly there criticizing, uh, you know, Trump? And uh, we could see the problem is the, the Romneys run the Republican Party here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. They are like, yeah. they have an ironclad grip on that. So that's the reason why there's nothing going to be changed here. And they, the offerings are really uh, putrid. Now, yeah, they, there I, are certain families, uh, John, that have uh, the, the Dingo family, the Kildee family. You know, Lucy, L, uh, uh, I think her name is uh, Lucy uh, uh, Dingo, was on uh, one of the programs yesterday. Uh, the idea was that no Democrats go crediting the president for having gone into, by having the uh, the special ops uh, go on the border of, of Syria and Turkey and take bin Laden's son out. John, that was a major event. And the Democrats had to act like they were glad the president had done, done, done the work for the nation. Because it was very obvious, I mean, this, this silence was deafening. And so um, Dingle, Lucy Dingle, who took over from her husband, you know, it, it's been the, family, the Dingle family, right? It's, for, a, it's, a, it's been the Dingle's been in power. For 50 years. Well, over that. Over Actually, that, because that's right. Of, because, over that. Because the old man... John Dingle's dad had was in there during the FDR years. FDR's administration. Yes, he helped sign in the uh, Social Security Act. Yeah, so I mean that's it's almost eighty years. It is a power. You see, these are power uh, groups, uh, power families, uh, and and then and then look at the um, the bloodlines inside of these uh, uh, networks, these family networks. It's not just. Um, John Adams, the second president, and then his son, John Quincy Adams, or the Harrison, who was elected in 1840, and his grandson, uh, Benjamin Harris, who was elected in, don't tell me, in uh, 1888, is the 20, who was the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, and um, Tippi Canoe and Tyler, too, right, in terms of 1840, who was the um, 14th, the 14th president came in after Maude Van Buren, who had been elected in 1836. You don't have to tell me. I have that in my, in my, uh, oh. you know, th that that's in memory. Well, look at FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okay, Actually, look was, at that. He was connected to eight past presidents and through familiar lines. Eight past presidents. You see, you see how it works, John. It's not what we think it is. It's something else that's going on. You know, also in terms of this endogamous. Um, 
relationship, these bloodlines, this the the aristocratic uh, aspect to the uh, power centers of this country. And I'll be the way next month when we deal with the uh, I think it's the fifth or sixth anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I want to put in the context, because uh, uh, I've, I've been doing some more research on it, which I want to share um, uh, some things uh, about that. Uh, we want to go back to Dealey Plaza and, and visit uh, what happened there through another lens. I, I'm, I'm going to be putting some things together there and working on it right now. And on the 22nd, around that time period, the 22nd of uh, next month, I'll be uh, sharing some things on Facebook and also on this network uh, around uh, that research piece. But yeah, it is, it's, 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 it's quite a bit different than what is being sold uh, to um, the American people, the public view of the way the country actually is run, you know, government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's the intentionalities of it. But that's not quite the way it works. But the theoretical aspect is that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which Abraham Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address, November the 19th, 1863, shall not perish from the earth. Well, it hasn't perished from the earth, but it is, in fact, smothered by these criminals that are running the government from behind their mask. And I'm going to try as much as I can with all the might that I can to pull that mask off. <laughs> and that's what's going to happen as long as there's breath in my body. And I'm going to continue to do that. And I'm going to do it to an extent that nobody else in the country is qualified to do it because I, I and I'm not bragging, but I understand uh, the Constitution a lot better than these scholars, these so-called scholars do. And what they're talking about is just really quite, if you look at it, quite an outrage. I, let me give you an example of that. So you won't think that I'm just simply picking on these people. I'm not picking on them. I'm just simply talking about them and, and telling you about them. You take, for example, last week where they were saying that the president, they're talking about this process they're going through. The president is having his rights uh, his, his constitutional rights being, uh, are being violated through the impeachment process that is going on right now. And they're having his, uh, they're, they're denying him due process of law. John, let me tell you something. There's no due, the, 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 the impeachment process is a political process. There is no due process of law in the political arena. There are no constitutional violations that are going on uh, in terms of what they are doing. What they are operate, they are, there is no impeachment process going on right now. These criminals these politicians, these criminal politicians in Washington are trying to act like they are, in fact, involved in an impeachment inquiry. There is no impeachment inquiry going on. You have some outlaw persons over these committees, like the, like this Gerald uh, Natler, you call him Jerry, I mean, Jerry, Jerry, not that Jerry, but another uh, 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 kind of uh, act that's, that the one that's not on television. Jerry uh, Natler from New York. And this, this guy over the Senate Judiciary Committee, and then um, you have this what do you want to call this guy? You have to be within the framework of of, of uh, staying uh, within the context of a family, you know, uh, programming. But what do you call Adam Schiff? I can't actually. If I said what I think of him, they'd take us off every <laughs> every media outlet. <laughs> John Jerry uh, Jerry Nadler Jerry not Gerald. J His name is Gerald. J-E-R-R-O-L-D. Gerald, not Jerry. Yeah, you get these names. Jerry, Jimmy. 
where you can fit with uh, uh, LBJ. You don't you don't have nothing for the conservatives like R W uh, uh, R W R. That'd be Ronald Wilson Reagan. They don't have no initials for him. If I said R W R, they would know who I'm talking about. If I say LBJ, if I say uh, JFK, oh, you know that FDR. Yeah, all the liberals have these. You see how it works? Well, yeah. Actually, I, I think there's a sign. Look, if you actually look at all the uh, people who've done the bizarre assassinations, <laughs> like uh, you know Mark David Chapman, the guy who shot this guy, all these guys got middle names. So that's what shows you what the uh, Democrats are. They're the yeah. psychopaths. Yeah, Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, Lee yeah, Lee Har look, look they John. They have their middle names. You hit, you're hitting some home runs out there in the in the uh, in in that part of the studio. You see, the, there's a lot of ways in which they can, in fact get a point across without necessarily being so direct about it. I mean, I've heard people, I'll give you an example of that, and I'm going to get back to my lesson, my, my subject today. I've heard some people go around uh, talking about, before they talk about global warming, they were talking about global crowdedness. And I heard some people going around like they were scientists. The world is overpopulated. They were quoting this guy named Paul Ehrlichman. You probably heard of him, John, the one that wrote about the um, uh, the, the 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 another global bomb. They talked about the population bomb. Yeah. Population bomb, right? They were talking about how the country is how the world is overpopulated. We got too many people on the planet. And I just rode through uh, 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 the 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 desert in. Uh, and 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 in uh, in Vegas and in uh, Arizona, you can you can ride through there, and if you better not run out of gas, because you're not gonna see no any people for how many miles was that? A hundred miles. You can you can drive a hundred miles down. Uh, well, not a hundred, but you know somewhere around around that uh, down ninety three. And if you run out of gas, you better put your thumb out there. Hope, hope a car will come by because you're out there by yourself. All that land out there undeveloped, all those mountains out there, they had to uh, uh, blow dynamite the mountains in order to build Las Vegas. Uh, uh, Bugsy uh, Siegel. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing what they constructed uh, out there because there was just nothing but desert out there. But you know how it is for the American people. We have uh, uh, some innovators, if these politicians would get out of the way, which they're not going to do, because they, because they are exactly what Donald Trump said, they're sick in the head. All of them. <laughs> and all that undeveloped land. So they have these people talking about the world. I heard, I've heard some people that hadn't even been, been to class, dropped out of school. They tell them, they're up there talking about the world is overpopulated. And I'm saying, man, you don't even know how many cousins you got. And the world is over overpopulated. You don't even know how, how many people in your family. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of, that because, because they taught that. Because anything they want you to know, they teach it to you. Subliminally. So everybody knows now the, the global warming. We're going to burn up in 12 years. And when that 12 years is over and we have not burned up, they'll make it 50 years. Because I got to tell you something. The world is not coming to an end and you can't end it unless you um, do something. Uh, first of all, you're not going to do it because in order to push that uh, button, you got to incinerate yourself. And that's one thing politicians are not going to do. They may send you off to do that, but they're not going to incinerate themselves. Uh, they're going to have some bunkers to, to protect, protect themselves because they are not that courageous. In fact, this is what Donald Trump was saying about um, uh, Abu Bakr El uh, Baghdadi, uh, Bin Laden's son. That sounds like a rap name, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. El Baghdadi. El Baghdadi. I mean, uh, yeah. John, did you see what he said about about him? Uh, you know, they had this. You know, they're not going to tell anybody because they don't want to give out these these national security uh, uh, secrets. 
But Donald Trump was watching that in live in, in real time. Did you know that, John? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember when um, they took down uh, Bin Laden? Bin Laden. They, oh, yeah. The, you know, uh, Obama was sitting in that room, and yep. all everybody said, oh, "No president's ever done that before." Um, well, you know. Okay, he's sitting there thousands of miles away from the action, so he's not in danger. Neither was Trump, but they still don't. They don't want to give him any credit for. Don't want to give him any credit, and gave Obama too much credit. But you know, where, you know where Obama was uh, before they went and got him uh, to bring him in there to make it look like he was actually running it and so on and so forth. Because that was all media created. Also, Obama was on a golf course, and where was Hillary Clinton at that time? Over there, obviously, probably deleting her emails. They went and got them and brought them into the room and then did the photo op to act, act like that Obama and Hillary Clinton were, in fact, running that operation because that's how they that's how they do it in terms of manipulating the public. But Donald Trump was was, was engineered, was right there in the, in the middle of this and gave the OK for them to go in there and get this guy because they had the intelligence that was watching it and um, had been watching the pattern and so on and forth, so forth and they locked in on him. Yeah, see, I, I, I thought it was, I mean, somebody actually stated that, that they they pulled out and made everybody think they, everybody pulled out. They had special ops people right there waiting. John, that's they, what. They kept the track of it. That's what yeah. happened. Yeah. They thought that the, that America was gone. And we were, and what, what we had there was a special ops that had already focused on his target. In fact, that place where Abu Bakr El Baghdadi was, they had that door to that site booby trapped. They knew that also. And that's why they blew a hole in the side and went in there. He wasn't ready for that. And he wasn't ready for those dogs they, they sent in there. So as to, in fact, go through there. You know, one of the dogs was um, seriously uh, injured because they were after him too. This is how this this is how well trained the operation was. And what Donald Trump said, um, 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 what Donald Trump said is very important. He was, in fact, he said they might show the video of it because they videoed this, and they may show the video to show those who want to follow these these persons, these terrorists. What kind of cowards they are? Because they were saying he was crying all the time before they blew him out of here. Well, another thing is too, aren't these? That's what be, happened. These supposed to be the stalwart people, the uh, the uh, the soldiers of Allah, yeah. waiting to, for their virgins in the in the afterlife, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I guess he wasn't really looking for all those virgins, right? Maybe, yeah, but maybe Muhammad they, they didn't ran do out it. Too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can talk about those seventy-two virgins to um, the followers. But the paradise that the prophet was 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 uh, enjoying was a paradise here. Even to the point of the pedophilia he was involved in. I'm talking about um, the the six year old bride that he had that he consummated the, the marriage when when she was nine Aisha, nine years old. And that's okay. Take that, that to the bank. And uh, Muslims get all offended when you say that they recorded this. Get this, offended all they was, want to. They recorded it themselves. So if you throw something back at them that's actually recorded <laughs> by their sources, how is that being offensive? I'm telling you the absolute yeah. truth here. I don't have time to be playing no games. There's no games here. No, I agree with you. It's, but it's all documented. All this has been documented. <laughs> Yet they'll say when you bring it up, these liberals will say you're just being mean spirited. <laughs> yeah, I right. mean, it's like no, it's documented. Yeah. You know, I uh, uh, I think it was one of the media that said. Uh, and this might have been a parody. I don't know. I haven't checked it out yet. But that was one of the one of the media reportedly. Um, uh, Don Lemon's name was attached to this, I, and I, I'm, I'm, it may have been a parody. But they said that one of the media, some of the media, was saying that they 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 uh, they describe the moment is that uh, Donald Trump eliminates the father of three children. And caused the death of the three children because they know they 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 blew up. He blew up three of three his three children, and then that, they, and so now now the media trying not to uh, give Donald Trump credit. Why? Because it takes them off of the narrative of Donald Trump is incompetent. He doesn't know what he's doing, and we got to impeach this guy before he in fact destroys the country. And so on and so forth, and that narrative w had to be put on pause because of what Donald Trump and the team that he, in fact, was over uh, in manning that that operation.
where they, where they, where they, they double back after creating a false sense of security, double back and they got this guy, which they have been targeting him and focusing on him for a while now. You know, that's like, you know what, I'll, I'll, grant, I'll grant you, the liberals may have a point. He's not a military expert. He never claimed to be. However, he put people in position who are experts in that to do the thing. He's a businessman. He's going to look for the best experts to handle the areas that he doesn't have the expertise in. And that's exactly what he did, and I applaud that. He did great. I he think did great, great, and we ought to applaud him for it. And, and, and no, he's not a military man. But that's what you got advisors for. And when it and there are some advisors in there that are not sabotaging this president that want this man to do well because they are patriots for the country. And if he does well, the country does well. So there are that there is that element in there also. But do not o overlook for one moment that there is this other element in there, such as this so-called whistleblower that they claim um, that he's not a whistleblower. What he is is a, he's a spy in there, in inside of the operation that is trying to bring this administration down because he's part of the deep state, which is um, working just fine inside of the nest that they have. And we've got to ferret them out because we, because now is an opportunity to go after these people. And it's either them or Trump, or put it more, more bluntly, it's them or us. Because those of us that understand What's at stake here? We we are we are backing this president up, and so therefore it's not just them or the Trump administration; it's them or the American people, because that is in whose name Donald Trump speaks and stands, because this man is truly trying to make this country great again, and they do not want that because they want to bring in something different than that which was intended by the framers, and that's the thing that they must stop. Because they're not talking about James Madison. They don't even teach that in school anymore because of the way the tests are, are structured by the government. And you have to teach the tests in order to get the, the test passed, in order to get the money for the schools to stay open and, and charter schools and things of that sort. They have to do it by the test scores. And so, therefore, they have to, they have to pass the test. And James Madison is not on there. Let's see how long, how long it will take them to put, put Karl Marx on there. Because that's where they want to. That's where they want to direct the the country in that direction. Because then they can have more control, and the people, we the people of the United States, will not be the people of the United States. But they tried it out. I was saying this earlier. They were trying out some. The question was being asked: Where are the Democrats? And they could not be kept. They could not all be kept silent because the silence was deafening. Why aren't they out there? If they are for the country, this man was was, was a, a a threat to the national security of the country, and they're claiming national security all the time. Why aren't they out there? So, Lucy Dingle comes out there. She's on one of the programs and talking out of both sides of her mouth, acting like she was really commending the uh, operation, trying not to say anything about about Trump but making it look like they were so happy about the, the success this president had. And he's talking out of both sides of her mouth. I was um, surprised, not surprised, I was um, uh, disappointed, not surprised, never surprised by anything politicians do, but I was disappointed in Tussie Gabbard. I thought she might have been a, a little bit more of a shining light over there because she was not as crazy as they are. But she was on TV the other day. She was on Sean Hannity's show, and she's talking out of both sides of her mouth. He tried to get her to say some things. She's not going to say it because it's a network that, that they're working uh, from. And they try and they pretend that they are independent from the root of the network, but they're all tied uh, to it. There's only one person that's out there that's independent of it. That's the person that you elected in, in 2016, and that's why they own his case. And they know that you're still with this man, and that's and they know they cannot, and they know two things. They don't have any horses on the other side, and they know that there's nobody that they can, in fact, feel that can defeat Donald Trump. It, they, they, they're not there. And that's why you're hearing noise about <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's why you hear these noises about Hillary Clinton, um, who said that 
I can beat him again. You haven't beat him the first time. Man, she should be in a straitjacket. She just doesn't have it real, you know, want to come to grips with reality. She did not win. We're three didn't, years into his presidency. We, you didn't win, Hillary. You know? didn't win, Hillary. And the mere fact that you would say that, when the fact is that you lost, and you lost because you don't elect the president through the popular vote. And I'm glad that you don't. The framers were too smart to turn this over to a single majoritarian group because they were, they were guarding against the possibility of tyranny and a single majority could become tyrannical. But you cannot become tyrannical if you have multiple majorities and they have to all be considered and that's what the Electoral College is about, not the stuff they're talking about. <clears throat> this is the, th these are the framers and they are still guarding over this country all these years later into the year 2019, and we are being protected by the framers, not by the politicians, who are still protecting this country because they put in there the check and balance system, which is what we should be talking about, not this nonsense about he's not being given due process of law, they're violating his constitutional rights, they're not violating his constitutional uh, rights in a political process. What they are doing is going outside of the, of, of the, uh, of the impeachment process. There's nothing going on right now uh, around the issue of impeaching Donald Trump. You can't impeach Donald Trump from no com committees. And that's what you have to understand. It's all a charade. There's no impeachment inquiry taking place right now. These are committees. You can't impeach the president from a committee. The Constitution says in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5, that the House shall choose its speaker and she have the sole, S-O-L-E, sole power of impeachment. And they're not doing that, and they dare not do it, because we got an election coming in 2020. You let them try it. <clears throat> okay, we'll be back next week, and I hope you'll stay, stay tuned to the programs here at the studio, all the programs here at the studio. And we will be back next week for another edition of the program called What's Going On? on allpointstv.com. Until that time, I want you to follow your dream because if you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.